editor in chief at Marvel. It still freaks me out that I can say those words. Um, you know, uh, this panel is always a very special one for me. Uh, you know, I was a fan going to conventions since I was a kid, and I would sit on that side and go to all these panels. And then one year I went to a show, and Joe Casada had a panel called Cup of Joe. And he said he created that panel specifically because he did the same thing and he wanted to be able to fans to ask questions and interact um, you know, with the people who actually make the comics, with who make the decisions. And um, you know, I kind of took that format when I took over and then we created Marvel Fanfare, which is kind of a similar experience. Um, what we're gonna do here today, I do like a little more of a talk show at the beginning uh, and then uh, we'll get into some questions and answers. There's gonna be a mic here that you'll be able to uh, to, use, uh, to, to ask the questions. And then if you stay until, oh, we, can we put the screen up? Is it gonna work? If you stay until the end, uh, everyone in the room will get a special limited edition comic created just for this panel. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the cover in a minute, uh, but this is a really special one for me because today, uh, as my guests, I have two comic book legends uh, who have served as mentors and inspiration as me since I was young and have helped me get uh, to the path where I am in terms of you know, being able to critique art, to being editor-in-chief, to becoming talent manager, all the positions I've had at Marvel. So without further ado, please let me introduce Joe Quesada. <laughs> Good to see you, Joe. You're here. Yep. And you know him, you love him, one of the most esteemed pencilers with one of the longest careers in comics, Mr. John Ramita Jr. Thanks for coming. I've got to have a lot of relatives, huh? Yeah. <laughs> or people. It all look Sicilian to me right now. Or they could be people you owe money to. <laughs> That's true. Did you pay the big? <laughs> Oh, so how are you guys doing? The Italian today? thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Paying the big. They don't get that here. <laughs> They've seen the Sopranos. <laughs> right? Or they've gone to Vegas, one or the other. He's, yeah. calling, me a, he's yeah. calling me a loan shark, this Cuban piece of garbage right now. Just... <laughs> <laughs> so you guys having a good show? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. San Diego. What's yeah, that? I mean, exactly really, right. It's better than San having San a real job. By the way, it's yeah. whether they're having a good show. You are guys you guys having, having a good show? Yeah. <laughs> See, this is the difference. I could really boldly say this now. This is the difference between a Marvel panel and a DC panel. Uh, <laughs> I, I kid. I love those guys. I'm doing some work for them, so they're. Uh, but but it's literally, the Marvel panels have always been incredibly energized. So glad you guys are here. Yep. Well, and again, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I did want to start uh, on a little bit more of a somber note, but it's a, a somber note that we wanted to definitely turn into a celebration. Um, you know, as, as many of you may know. Uh, the, the esteemed John Romita Sr. Uh, recently passed. And, um, you know, John, I think I speak for everyone in this room, for everyone in the comic community, for everyone at Marvel, when we do sincerely offer our condolences. You Thank know, you very for much. Your loss. Thank you, everybody. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody loved him. Greatest man I ever met. The Gene Kelly of comics. I remember. All right. I remember, uh, I he couldn't dance. But he was no, a, no, no. But be, be, <laughs> before I met him, Joe Rubenstein, you know, you know Joe, right? Yeah. He, yeah. So Joe, Joe said, Have you, "Do you know John Romita Sr.?" I'm like, "No." Uh, and I'm like, well, when you meet him, he's the Gene Kelly of comics. So I kept thinking that, and I met. I him never heard like, that before. He does look like Gene Kelly? <laughs> he really does, you know. And he's just, you met, your dad was amazing. He really was. And I, I do think, you know, they, they, they say, you know, gone but never forgotten. And you know, the, the legacy, the, the body of work, the contributions that, that your dad made you know, to, to comics um, in terms of not just the characters he created, but the generations of artists that he inspired through the bullpen, and your mother as well, Virginia as well, you know, a uh, long time, so long with Marvel. Um, you know, the, the, the comic industry will forever owe, you know, the, the, a, a debt of gratitude to, to, to the Ramita family. So uh, thank you for, for everything that you've done and for joining us here today to celebrate, thank you, thank you know, you. where we've come. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you guys to start then. Um, you know, you've both had long careers in many different ways. Joe, I know a little bit more about, uh, you know, your, your, your story because we've, we've, I've heard you tell the stories a lot. You know, John, we've spoken many times about, you know, your start in the career and how you, you came up. But do you remember, so the fans can, can, can know, the first printed comic book that ever contained your work? 
I, it was a Punisher cover. No, no, no. Uh, oh, man, I can't remember if it was a Punisher was cover one? or was it the, yes. <laughs> That's right. It was that one. Yes, it was a Punisher cover. And then, because I, I couldn't remember if it was that one or the Ghost Rider cover, but the Ghost Rider cover is the first one that, uh, Snowblind was the first one that got me any attention, where people okay. go, oh, look at this. All right. And John? The first full issue I ever did, I think, was Iron Man 115. 115? I think okay. it was Iron Man 115. Nice. Wow. Yeah, that's what I said. Wow, because every time somebody brings it up, I can't believe I got more work after this. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was awful. Just roll with it. That's and right. I, sorry I don't have your covers. I know, you know, we... That's <laughs> all right. I don't take any offense. a long time ago. I don't know yeah, if they yeah. still have that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Age <laughs> joke. Next will be height jokes. Watch this. Because when we were building this deck, Joe, because, you know, you and I were uh, you know, planning this for a little bit, um, I, for some reason, thought your first cover was a Sleepwalker cover. Because I know you, but that was, came later, because it, 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 it was actually our research team that went and said, no, 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 this was Joe's, yeah. we think this was Joe's first cover, so this was. Mm -hmm. But this was along those lines, too, right? Yeah. It wasn't although, the first one, right? No, the first one was inked by Kevin Nolan, you know? And, and I remember doing this, Jimmy and I, Pamiati, my, my, my old uh, creative partner, we used to joke about this, uh, about Sleepwalker. Uh, and it's like, you know, what an incredibly enticing title for a character, <laughs> right? Like, you know, sleep and walk. Not like a wake runner, <laughs> sleepwalker, you know? And uh, yeah, it didn't, didn't last <laughs> very long, but I did those covers. Well, now, just I'm going to go off topic a little bit because maybe I see some very young fans here in, in the audience. And everybody might not know how a comic book is 100% made. So, so you guys know, you've heard the names, you know, uh, you just heard Kevin Nolan, you heard Joe Rubenstein. Um, they are comic book inkers, so you know just the the, the real bare bones, uh, you know, production processes. When you make a comic book, there's really six people involved. So you have the writer, the penciler, who is actually the artist who takes the script and breaks it down and pencils the art. You usually have the inker, who then goes in and puts a black line over everything, enhances depth, you know, fills it anything. Joe and John can probably talk a little bit more about technically about that. There's the colorist, uh, there's the letterer, and then there's the editor. Uh, so those are literally the six people who put into, uh, you know, um, work, on, work, on, work on the comic stories month in and month out. But um, inkers tend to not get a lot of credit. Um, and you both just, the first people you brought up were inkers that you worked with. And John, you said specifically, you know, saved your ass. And Joe, you, Kevin really enhanced your stuff. So can you just talk briefly about the importance of a comic book inker and what they bring to the table? They're the second artist. They're the other artist, that's, there's no two way. I work with a guy named Scott Hanna, who's a brilliant artist unto himself. He's an ink artist, he's not just an inker. Uh, and I say that because I remember working with Al Williamson who laughed at me when I said, you're, just, you're making my stuff look great. He says, I'm just tracing you, shut up. And he was lying through his teeth. Mm -hmm. And anybody that thinks an inker just traces is, is ignorant. These guys are brilliant artists in and of themselves. Yeah. And in the case of Al Williamson, Al Williamson drew better than all of us. He was a brilliant illustrator before yeah. he, he said he was just paying the electric bill by it. Yeah, well, he, he, well he, admittedly, he was, he was slow, right? So, so he, he and, and he, it, it, it wasn't as enjoyable to him to, to okay. pencil. Penciling was like, like, it was like, pain, you know, in a lot of ways. But if you ever look up his work, Al Williamson, I mean, you know, so much of Star Wars is based on stuff he's done. I mean, admittedly, George yep. Lucas cites Al Williamson. So when Al was inking you on Daredevil, I was, I was a little kid reading that book. I knew and, it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, I, I own three, I like, I own three Don't pages. Don't start your that. car later on. That's right. all I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I, I own three pages from that book because of that combination. Is that right? Of, yeah, that combination of you and Al Williamson to me was the greatest art that had ever been created on that character, hands down. You know, um, it was that was that was very. It was an honor to, to work with that man as, on that title. Yeah. But I've been lucky to work with some great artists who happen to be ink artists, mm -hmm. Klaus, Scott, yeah. and uh, Williamson, and I got some of the best saved covers in history because of my father. Yeah. So I'm with, lucky. Yeah, with with Kev, Kevin Nolan, <laughs> it's like I don't know, I don't know why why Kevin inks me uh, because he he draws much better than I do. And and when we first were teamed, we actually were teamed up on a Sleepwalker cover. And so up here you can see it down here, but up here some of the, the, the we yeah. just wanted to pull out a couple of the key the key pieces um, you know that we see for for define you as the artist for Marvel. No. Um, you know the the Daredevil piece. Mm. I think the the middle piece was for the was that a, a Young Guns? <sighs> yeah, maybe. I, I forget out? it, but that that was yeah. It, it's actually a massive piece. That was like six covers. That yeah. made up six covers, and uh, that Iron Man piece was from something I don't know. It was something Iron Man related. <laughs> yeah. I think there was one with the reflection in the. Oh no, that was a different piece. That was. That was. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It's not there, though. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, c coming up, you, you, you always tell the story how you started as a colorist and then how you, you broke into Marvel. The transition, when you were, you came on for Marvel Nights, mm -hmm. and, and I want to talk about since, you know, I now, uh, you know, walk in the shoes that you once had. Um, the, the transition going from artist to editor in chief. What was that like for you? I mean, how did that come about? What was it? Was it something that you sought or you willingly fell into? I mean, no. I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't sit. You know, when I was reading my first Marvel comic as a, as a you know as nine, a nine year old, I never once thought that I could have you know be seated in the same seat as Stan Lee, right? And so I, I would never had aspirations to become editor in chief. But when we when Jimmy and I negotiated our Marvel Knights deal, I've told the story a couple of times, so if you guys have heard it, sorry. Uh, but, but, you know, when we were having our, our, we were going to have a dinner with the then president of Marvel, uh, Joe Calamari, wonderful man. And Joe was looking to see what it was that we could do. Uh, package a few books for them, you know, bring whatever our, you know, our bit of artistic magic, whatever we had at that time, uh, to the books. So Jimmy and I were at my apartment, which was a block away from the restaurant we were going to meet Joe at and and we were just you know comparing our notes. All right, we're gonna we're gonna ask for literally we're gonna ask for Daredevil, Black Panther, Inhumans, and Punisher. Right? Okay, good, good, good. And and then I said no, no, yes, but we're gonna ask for everything. Like, Jimmy was like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, we're just we're just gonna tell Joe that we should be co-editor in chief and just give us everything. Why mess around? Why waste time? And Jimmy starts laughing. And I'm like, yeah, but he's like, he's not gonna do that. He's, he's gonna laugh at us. I'm like, he will. And then he's then we'll say, all right, give us four titles. And he'll settle on that. So we go to dinner, and uh, and Joe's like, you know, yeah, so you know, what do you guys want? What do you want to do? What do you want? I said, Joe, just let's cut to the chase. Make us co-editor in chief. We will save this place. We'll fix it all. And Joe just starts. Bawling, laughing, right? He's like, "How about if I give you four books?" Like, <laughs> there you go. All right, we'll settle for that. And then, you know, we gave him the titles, and we strategically picked those titles because they were they were either non-existent, about to be canceled. Uh, yeah, th those two things, non-existent, about to be canceled, and they weren't A-list titles, right? So, because they weren't going to give us Spider-Man, X-Men, and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, I forgot your question, CB, but that's 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 the end and of the story. And then, what was the step for you to t to become editor in chief? So, Nice came out. Nice was a huge success. Um, you know, mm -hmm. to find a lot of those characters for even to today yeah. for the, the generation. And then the big chair, how did you eventually come into that? You know, Bill Jemis came up to me and, uh, and asked me if I wanted the job, right? I'm like, well, you already have an editor-in-chief. And he's like, you know, we're looking to make a change. Um, so I said, I, I think this was on a Friday. So I said I needed the weekend to think about it. So uh, I remember sitting there the weekend sweating this and, 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 and going over the math in my head not because of the, what the job entailed, but because Marvel was in Chapter 11. Mm -hmm. So uh, I remember having a discussion with my wife, and I, I said, look, I, this could just be, literally, I could have just been handed the best seat in the Titanic. I can go down as the guy that, you know, without even, you know, it's out of my control, uh, as the guy who was in that chair when Marvel went belly up. And most likely at that point, the industry would go belly up. And uh, she said the thing that changed my life, which she said, well, do you know, if, if you say no, do you know who's gonna take that job? I said, no. She's like, then maybe better the, better, the devil you know? Mm -hmm. And that was it. So I went back the next, uh, the Monday, and I told Bill, all right, let's do it. I'll take the job. And that's kind of how it happened. And, and then, you know, the, the, the challenge, of course, was that there were, there were staffers there that were very loyal to the, you know, to Bob Harris, who's the previous editor in chief. And I understand Bob was a great guy, and you know, uh, he did a lot at Marvel. And uh, it, it was it was tough breaking, breaking through that barrier at first. There were one of the things I learned was, you know, during I don't mean this to sound cruel, but you know, during 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 that kind of Chapter Eleven bankruptcy kind of thing, you know, th there are employees that are just not going to move forward with you because they're, they're, they're part of a different paradigm, a different system, or in some respect, they're, they're just broken, right? They just, they, they, it's, it's not gonna work for them. So we, we, there was a lot of adjusting and you know, people we had to let go, new people we had to bring in for a new philosophy. Um, and then there was the thing that I was an artist. I was the first artist to actually sit in an editor-in-chief's chair, yeah. which I wasn't expecting that to be a thing, but it became a thing. I mean, and I know, I know that folks that, competing publishers laughed about this, right? It's like, what does he know about it? And that just fueled me, right? Um, 
because you know while while I was an artist, as you know, we are storytellers, and uh, I did a lot of work on 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 you know learning how to tell stories properly and, and studying screenwriting and all that sort of stuff. So I was loaded for bear and. Then stuff happened, and we, we just you know made a go of it, and uh, you know this gentleman was a huge part of that success. Yeah. Now, John, going back, and the way comics are made now is you know most of the freelancers uh, work at home. We have a talent management system that we'll talk about in a little bit, possibly because Joe, you helped to institute the system and create that, you know, during our, our run at Marvel the first time. And but John, going back, you know, when you started, were you actually going to the office and working in the bullpen? The very first thing I did was I was a, uh, an intern, basically, yeah, mm -hmm. for Roy Thomas. And I would log the pages that came in from Buscema and a couple other guys and photocopy. And, and then I would fix anything that needed to be fixed, uh, whatever Roy wanted. And that lasted about 18 months. I was called an art consultant. Okay. And I was doing uh, covers, cover sketches and splash page sketches for the British department as well when they would cut the uh, American books in half and published them in the UK, they needed a new cover and a new uh, splash page and I would do the sketches and then I did some of the covers and the, and the splashes. But that's how I started. I was an art consultant. I was washing windows, basically. All right. And now when you took over, when you said Iron Man 115, was that when you started working from home? You had a home studio or, yep. That's correct, yeah. And I, as soon as I had done that, that uh, miniature thing in the uh, annual, despite the chaos of the coffee bean. And then I remember uh, somebody came in and said, Dan Atkins just dropped out of uh, doing Iron Man. Would you like it? Just simple as that. I don't, no, it was Scott, very tall Scott. I can't think of his name. It'll come to me in a minute. He said, I don't believe in nepotism. I don't believe in anti-nepotism either. No. And he no. said, so if you want Iron Man, you can have it. Wow. And it was simple as that. And it's, it, it, how were assignments doled out back then? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about the system. Do you remember? Like, e each office controlled a certain amount of books. It wasn't as centralized uh, as a, a, a talent regime, right? Yeah, I, I don't know what their thoughts were as, as far as who gets what. But um, I had done a couple of Iron Man pinups, a couple of covers, and I think that they saw something in that. I don't know what they saw, but they saw it. And, uh, and then the first issue with, uh, with Leighton on it, I guess it was... They thought it was great, and that was it, and it became something else. Wow. And the stories, Michelinie's stories, were, were brilliant. It was a wonderful experience. Yeah, great, great, great. And now, so then there was Iron Man. I mean, you've touched almost every character at Marvel at this point, I believe, right? Inappropriately. I even touched this character. <laughs> <laughs> but now, uh, you know, you can never pick your, your, your favorites, and we've talked about things you still want to do, but what's it like after being back on Spider-Man? I mean, now here you are, Zeb Wells, you telling this amazing run on, uh, uh, story on, uh, no pun intended, on Spider-Man. Um, just what's it like returning to that character? Well, was, was, was you, is it like riding a bike? You had to shake off some of the cobwebs? Uh, not really, uh, maybe, maybe hand-wise, artistically, possibly, oh. took a, a couple of days. I don't know. But all I know is that when I was told that there was a chance of getting back to Marvel, they offered me the chance to work on X-Men, Spider-Man, or Daredevil. And um, when Scott Hanna found out, he, he said, if you don't accept this, I'll kill you. And he said, we should work together. I wanted to get back on Spider-Man. Oh. I also wanted to get back on Daredevil. The X-Men, I was a little bit nervous of doing a group book, but... Uh, it was a nice offer. However, working on Spider-Man again was like coming home, and as simple as that. And I got a chance to do it again. I'm very happy. And it's a great conversation piece. What do you do for a living? I draw Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm but just... there was one point that scared the crap out of me was that I was going back, and it was kind of made to be a big deal, and I was, I was under a microscope, just like I was under a microscope when I went to the other guys. And I hate being under a microscope. I hate being... Having the spotlight on me, I'd rather just be quiet and see if the thing sells. You're such a wilting flower, man. You know, it's like it's like nobody ever knows you're in the room. <laughs> I'm shy. What can I tell you? Yeah, right. Okay, let's move on. It was fun. It's coming home again. It was nice. And then I got told by the person that caused me to leave, it was a mistake. We apologize. All right. And that meant a lot. And I said, Mom, you shouldn't talk to me like that. <laughs> I just have to apologize too. To have, you have to put up with Nick Lowe, and we all know what that's like. So yeah, I don't even work there anymore. Hey, and I apologize, of, Nick. Now, Lowe. Here's, speaking of Nick Lowe, uh, Nick has has got 
Is Nick here? I don't know if he's it's a habit. I hope he's here. I'm not going to make fun of him. I'll wait till he's, uh, to do it behind his back before you. <laughs> I, I don't know. He might have had to run to another panel. But yeah. Nick, Nick will point out a couple of things that uh, don't look, if an eye is uneven or if an eyebrow is off, and he'll, he'll call or he'll email uh, Scott Hanna and say, Scott, this looks a little bit off. Can you fix this? And it might well be my stuff that caused it, but Scott never takes any chance to, to shoot at me. He fixes it himself. So we have an editor that makes slightest of changes because if he doesn't see something perfectly balanced. And I crack up because that's what an art director is supposed to do, and he's the editor of the book. He's playing art director. And that's good. I don't mind. But it makes me conscious, and I have to make sure the eyes are balanced on every face now, knowing he's going to say something. <laughs> So, Joe, obviously, you know, over your career, too, you've drawn most every Marvel character as well. Um, you know, is there a character that you have not drawn that you would like to draw? Or, you know, if you were, what's next? What would you, who, who would you like to tackle next? Uh, you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't given it a lot of thought. You know, I mean, I, there, there's something, well, hell, there's stuff I'm working on now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know you know, so, so that I, I'm kind of doing it. That's I'm kind I'm of doing it. And I have a, you know. We haven't mentioned anything, you know. I've, I've shown a couple little pieces of artwork here and there, but you know, there's some characters on it. I mean, it, it's it's a you know, it's a cross character thing. But um, but you know, I've been you know now that that I'm not sitting in a chair, right? Uh, whether it's editor in chief, chief creative officer, or whatever, uh, art or um, artistic director. Um, I have more time to, to actually devote to it. So you know, we're we're moving along with it. It's going to be pretty cool. Yep, and uh, that's where I was leading to, actually. All right. uh, you know, for those that don't yep. know, Joe has a, um, a Substack, uh, an email uh, newsletter that he sends out, and you have been, like you said, hmm? teasing some yep. of the, up, some, no one has figured it out yet, thankfully. No, been no. Some it's, of the, it's, the, the project that you're working on for us currently. Yeah, so yeah, so, so the Substack, guys, it's, it's uh, I'm having a blast. You know, I've been planning on doing the Substack for like the last six months or so. Um, and it's basically a catch-all for, for, for everything from stories about you know my past, my experiences in comic books. Uh, there's gonna be tutorials in there. I mean, I'm gonna be doing, a, probably next couple of weeks, gonna be doing a, a segment on, on how to build your, the perfect portfolio uh, to make, if you're an artist, to, to hopefully make your life easier when you approach a company and either get hired or get proper notes. You know, we've talked about this. Mm -hmm. You know, how to pitch to the bigger companies, what they might be looking for. You'd be surprised, because these things are actually much simpler than you might think they are. Um, but I'm trying to make it entertaining as well. So if you if you want to sign, and the other thing is, it's free. I'm literally, you know, it's, it's totally free. Uh, and it's just musings. Uh, every, every one of these newsletters is a little different than the others. And hopefully you find it entertaining. So if you, if you want to sign up for free, just scan the, the QR code there and uh, you become part of the family, so to speak. Uh, and it's called Joe Quesada's Drawing the Line Somewhere. Um, it forces me into speaking in the third person, which I hate doing, but you know, now that I'm marketing and shilling myself as opposed to Marvel, I have no choice. Uh, so yeah, so I'd love to have you guys you know, subscribe and be a part of it. Anybody here already subscribing? Anybody? All right. All right, yeah. All right, nice. Oh, hey, how are you? <laughs> I know that group. <laughs> Thank you. And now, John, online, I know you post mainly on Instagram, correct? Instagram and all the other social media things. My son does it for me. Uh, yeah, so, like, like fashion stuff? I, I, he, huh? Like fashion stuff? Or? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a fashion. Shirtless? Do you go shirtless? Oh, of course. Of oh, course. I got a The senior hunk of the month. Yeah. <laughs> I got the, wait, wait, still, wait, wait. how many years later, somebody brought it up to me today. Again? I cannot get away from that piece of garbage. I That's, can't that, Yeah, weren't you like the most eligible bachelor? No, it was, was a it? practical joke by Shooter. He told me, because there were three or four guys that were of a, a young age and were single, he says, we're going to do something, and we're going to joke and make fun of ourselves, and it's going to be a hunk of the month. You'll be one, and then Leighton, and then Sinkevich, and so on. Yeah. yeah. I got stuck as the only one. The only one, yeah. And I never, I never got back at Shooter, even when I sent that hooker to his apartment with the guns. I never. <laughs> uh, weren't you sporting like a like a glorious mullet? The best mullet. Let me tell you something. If we ever see new mullets, they don't compare to the mullet I had. No. <laughs> the only reason I don't have another mullet is because there's too much gray hair in the mullet. So I want to avoid that. And I'm not going to color my that hair. Was awesome. I mean, I had a mullet, but it didn't compare. Nothing. That was not one wrestler had a better mullet than I did. I had the best one. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm going to go into a couple announcements, actually. So who wants to see some new Marvel news? 
So uh, I think this was uh, announced earlier at a retailer panel, so then it might be out there, but Marvel loves to celebrate our anniversaries. Uh, so, you know, this year uh, was the 60th anniversary of the X-Men and the Avengers, if you can believe that. Uh, it's been a big year-long celebration. Uh, next year, a couple of our characters are having their, uh, uh, sorry, later this year, another character is having his 50th anniversary, uh, and it's one you might not expect, but it's a character that most people know and love, Howard the Duck. <laughs> <laughs> Chip Zdarsky, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Chip Zdarsky and Joe Canonis had a really good run on that book recently. They're huge fans of the character. Uh, you know, uh, when we said we were doing a 50th anniversary special, Chip was more than happy uh, to come back and bring some uh, fellow collaborators with him. Uh, Ed McGinnis did this wonderful cover. And uh, basically what we're, we're going to be seeing here is Howard getting a look through uh, the multiverse and what his life could have been uh, in other places over the last 50 years in the Marvel Universe. Uh, so this is coming out in November 2023. It is going to be a blast. Uh, it's going to be a, a really wonderful special by number of, uh, just a couple more artists uh, are joining as well. So please, if you're a, a Howard the Duck fan, this is not to be missed. Uh, next up, we teased a little something online recently happening in Venom uh, 26 and 27. So uh, the Venom symbiote has taken over a number of different characters over the years. Uh, more, you know, Eddie Brock, now it's on Dylan, uh, you know, Carnage, Cletus Cassidy, it's all taken on different, uh, different incarnations. But uh, this time, uh, it's coming for the Black Widow. Uh, there's gonna be a story coming up where we will see Black Widow become Venom. Pretty awesome, right? I, I absolutely adore that logo. Like a lot of people don't see that it had the uh, you know the hourglass in there, but um, this is a change that will uh, stick around uh, for Natasha as she goes through uh, some new adventures in the Marvel Universe 2023 and 2024. And uh, here you're going to see that design by Cafu, just simply amazing. Uh, and I just encourage everybody, if you like the Black Widow and if you like Venom, this is a story that is definitely not to be missed. Now, John, speaking of coming back to characters, uh, you had just said earlier that when you, you came back, you were offered three things. Uh, there was Spider-Man, there was uh, the X-Men, and then there was Daredevil. Now, I think we have some never-seen-before art uh, to debut here. The cover to Daredevil number three and the cover to Daredevil number four. So not only did you come back to Daredevil, you got to draw Bullseye pretty, pretty early on as well, huh? Yeah, that's, that's fun to do those covers. And, and I love that character, love drawing that character. No webs. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from a project I believe is gonna be announced tomorrow, uh, Spider-Man related, obviously. And I'll give you one more sneak peek of this amazing spread that John did. Look at that. So there will be more news about this project uh, tomorrow at the next big thing panel. Oh, well, Hannah just knocked that out of the park. He is yeah. brilliant. He is brilliant. Now, now, John, how long does something like that take you? Like you, you talked about the double page. That spread. double spread took me two days. The, the previous one. This one was one day. One day. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and now. Speaking of just uh, art styles, uh, are you still working uh, pencil on board, or have you moved digital? I'm Old school, baby. Yeah, I can't get myself to work on a, on a, a laptop, or I can't do it. It's got to be a pencil and eraser, especially the eraser. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Joe, what about, what about you? I do make sure both. Uh -huh. um, I do a lot of, I mean, I, I work digitally a lot. I cannot work on an iPad, though. I've tr I wish, really wish I could, but, you know, I, I need to work on a, large tablet, so it feels more like a, I fool my brain into thinking it's a drawing board. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends on the project. It, it depends on the project, and it depends on, um, uh, again, what, what it entails, you know? Um, but I, I do both. What, what I'm almost 100% doing now, are do, I do my layouts 100% digitally. Mm -hmm. That saves some time. Um, and then, you know, because what I always used to do traditionally would be, I would pencil my layouts small, blow them up on a Xerox machine, and then light box and draw away that way. So it's the same thing. I just do my layouts digitally and then I print it up and I light box and pencil. So. I am completely devoid of digital. Yeah. I just work, I get a, a plot and but I just I, put notes, I thumbnail in the borders uh, and then I just start roughing it on the page and yeah. tighten it up from there. 
And it's just all pencil, paper, and eraser. That's it. I feel old school, but it's a good school. I like it. But now, John, did you used to, I remember hearing at one point, did you used to draw almost six pages at the same time at some points or multiple? Not, not, the not pages? I would have them, I rough out a half a book at a time or a full book and then I tighten it. But I will put them up because sometimes if I skip to a middle page to tighten it up, I will keep the pages prior to it so I know exactly where the figures are that are roughed out. But that's just, it depends on how I feel. If there's a page in the middle of it, like for instance, I did this before the, the uh, earlier pages because this was so much fun. That one I did, I had no choice but to do it uh, at the time that it was asked for. But uh, I, I like to line up the pages prior to that random page. On my, I have a gigantic drafting table. It's bigger than my first apartment. It's beautiful. And I keep the pages prior to that page available so I can see where figures are all the time. That's, that's pretty much it. Awesome. 